Thank you, everybody, for coming. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I'm Tim Carney. I'm a visiting fellow here, as well as a, uh, a senior political columnist at The Examiner. What I do here is the two programs I'm involved with are called, one's called The Culture of Competition, where we talk about competition, we talk about things like subsidies and crony capitalism, and when competition yields good fruits, and when the pursuit of profit might not yield good fruits. The other thing I work on is called, um, <clears throat> is called the Program on Human Flourishing, where uh, we talk about happiness. And both of those topics are addressed in our book we'll be discussing today, which is the upside of down, while failing well is a key to success. Here to talk about this, we have the author, Megan McArdle. Uh, Megan is an economics writer at Bloomberg. She's written at The Atlantic, The Economist, Newsweek, uh, in addition uh, to writing this, her first book. Our respondent is Tyler Cowen from uh, George Mason University and the Mercatus Center. Uh, you might know him from his blog, Marginal Revolution, and his uh, recent books, A Great Stagnation and Average is Over. A couple quick comments about the program here before we begin. Uh, first, if you've got a cell phone, just uh, turn it off. Uh, feel free if you want to do uh, Twittering stuff about this to, to do that too. Just we don't want phones ringing during this. There will be time for audience questions, but it'll, it won't be a formal question and answer. We'll intersperse it, and we're going to have um, something of a conversation here. So if you have a question, try to spend some time thinking of how to make it as concise as possible because uh, we're going to break up at about 6.30 for wine and cheese, and we're selling uh, copies of the book outside. Megan will sign them. If you like what you hear, I recommend you buy them. I'm very much in favor of people buying books that they find interesting. This is a very important economic activity. Me too. Yes. <laughs> so, again, thank you for coming. Megan, I uh, read the book. I love the book. I thought there was a dozen interesting things in, in here. More than that, uh, stories about from all sorts of things, ranging from <clears throat> bad dates you had to failed companies um, to drug addicts. Uh, I, I, my favorite line that I think I can remember off the top of my head was, "If you don't already have uh, trouble with delayed gratification, the best way to get there is to get develop a drug habit." It was I'm probably misquoting it, but no, that's um, all right. no end of interesting stories in the book. But for this crowd here, we've got a Washington uh, crowd. What do you think is the most interesting thing you came across while writing it or the most interesting thing they will come across while reading it? So I think we all know that failure is a learning opportunity and that often we learn things by failing, uh, starting with the way we learn to walk, which is mostly a, a tale of tripping and plummeting and getting up and going over, all the way up to how the economy learns, right? Most products fail, most companies fail, even a successful entrepreneur who has done this before has a seven out of 10 chance of failing the next time he tries to start a company. So the most interesting thing that I actually learned was how amenable kind of bad failure attitudes are to change. And I learned this in my own way. There's, um, as a writer, I have what psychologists call a, a fixed mindset, which is basically there's two ways that you can approach a challenge. You can approach it as an opportunity to learn something and expand, kind of expand your brain, or you can approach it as a, a dipstick that is measuring your innate level of talent and ability. Most writers are the latter kind of person. They call that a fixed person, a fixed mindset. Um, Growth mindset people tend to do better. They tend to take on more challenges. They tend to learn more from the challenges that they do face. They do it again. They develop more skills and they grow more. But it's a hard mentality to develop, especially you look at the way most kind of bright kids go through school. It's easy, right? And you learn from that that success is about finding work easy. And then when you get to the big leagues, that's no longer true. You're competing with all the people who found it easy. And you have to have the grit and resilience uh, to first take on things where you really might fail, and second of all, to learn from them. So I was talking to Carol Dweck, who's the psychologist who came up with this distinction through her research. And I said, at the end of the interview, I felt like I kind of had to confess. I said, I feel like a fraud because I'm a total fixed mindset person. <laughs> I totally feel like every time I take on a challenge, this is a measure of me as a person. And if I fail, uh, that just means that I, I never had what it took. And she said, oh, me too. It's actually pretty common among academics. And she said, but I changed. 
I changed, and I knew I had changed when I heard myself saying, wow, I suck at this. This is really fun. <laughs> um, and I thought, wow, I'm never going to get there. <laughs> I don't like doing things I'm bad at. I never have. And then over the course of writing the book, I did. I really actually changed. And it wasn't because you know, a lot of these books end up being 12 steps to help yourself through failure. And that's not really what this book is. But the interesting thing is that it wasn't a 12-step program. It was actually just reminding myself of the truth which is that when we take on things we don't know how to do, you think about how you learn to play tennis. You didn't sit down and develop an elaborate theory of tennis physics. If, if that were the way to get good at tennis, then every year Wimbledon would be won by some guy with glasses from MIT, right? Um, that is not actually the case. You learn to play tennis by hitting a ball and it doesn't go where you think it will. And it doesn't go where you think it will for the first 10 or 20 or 100 times. And then eventually, basically by accident, you hit it in the right direction. But your brain makes a little connection there, and you say, oh, right, that's how it feels. You don't know quite what you did, though, so usually the next time you hit it, it doesn't go where you, but over time, you develop that talent for finding the few things that work out of the many, many, many wrong ways to hit a tennis ball. Um, and so developing that ability to embrace that isn't a matter of, of having a 12-step program. It's just a matter of reminding yourself that this is true. And when you face something, saying to yourself, you know what, I might not be very good at this. Probably I won't, I haven't done it before, but I can get better. And the way I'm gonna get better is by doing it and not being, being very good at it. And similarly with things like unemployment, with things like what uh, psychologists call the fundamental attribution error, where you tend to attribute things that happen um, to the agency of some person, this person, when someone's mean to you in the supermarket, you usually think, wow, that's a terrible mean person. You don't think, wow, she probably had a bad day and maybe her mother's sick. Uh, just reminding yourself that usually it's, it's because her mother's sick. Most people do not just randomly wander around snarling at everyone they meet. Um, really does change how you interact with those people. And so that was actually the most surprising thing that I learned was that it's easy to describe the ways in which it's hard to fail, but I was kind of surprised at how easy it is to merely by describing them get better at doing it. Tyler, you have ideas and thoughts and opinions on nearly every subject, whether it's uh, Thai food in suburban strip malls or the unemployment rate or whether inflation is, in fact, everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. So when you read Megan's book or listened to what she was saying now, what was the, the thing that struck you as most interesting? This book, first of all, this is a great book, and you should all go out and buy nine copies of it. <laughs> and, we could be calling it the upside of up. Uh, I learned from this book we should teach young children to play chess at a very early age. Because you cannot be good at chess right away, so you have to learn failure. And furthermore, your failure is rather brutally measured. And you see everyone around you failing, and you know exactly how bad you are. But you also have a way of learning how to do better, and you can measure your progress. And this is one of the most important skills to teach people early on is how to fail. And we need to think about this more in educational terms. Uh, so when I think of failure and how to move towards success, I think immediately of issues concerning children. So say that one had a child, and you're asking yourself, what can you do to make this child learn the lessons of this book? To me, that's really the big question coming out of this book. To some extent, we've learned these lessons as a nation. I'm afraid we're going to forget them. I'm afraid we're headed toward a future where there's so little privacy and so much measurement, maybe eventually genetic measurement, that we will lose a lot of the upside of down and become a society where second chances are more difficult. I'm also intrigued by the idea that there are some areas where failure is really good for you and other areas where failure is completely disastrous. So some of you may have read Megan's recent blog post on Mt. Cox. Uh, the Bitcoin conduit, which has just completely gone poof, and the money is gone. It's what, you know, 13% of all Bitcoin in circulation? Is that the number? I don't know what the exact number is, but it is a large percentage. <laughs> it's a large percentage. Now, Megan predicts that Mt. Gox going poof will eventually spell the end or a dramatic decline of Bitcoin. So we don't say, well, Gox went poof, so Bitcoin is going to learn something. There's a fixed architecture to Bitcoin and you have properties of increasing return systems based on liquidity and common focal points. So there you have a case where both the architecture and the increasing returns to scale 
means that mistakes multiply and accumulate, and then things will go poof. So to try to think about more systematically, what are the cases where we see learning, Kersnerian learning in the Austrian sense, and what are the cases where things go poof? Sorry, what did that term mean? <laughs> Kersnerian, Israel Kersner, entrepreneurship, learning. Okay. It doesn't matter if you don't know what it means, <laughs> learning. <clears throat> what are the conditions where you get one outcome or the other? What should you actually read for insight into this? I would say read the upside of down, and then read the sequel, The Upside of Up. And I predict there will be such a sequel. The problem with chess, uh, as far as learning the upside of down that I've encountered, is that I am teaching my daughter and son to play chess. And so the, as a result, I always win, because they're seven and five. And I've beaten them every single time. And now I, I, my brother challenged me to chess, and I was afraid to play him, because I've gotten so used to winning. I, I don't know if I could handle it. Um, on a, uh, on a policy front, your book ends with a discussion of uh, U.S. bankruptcy code and how that's uh, so different from the rest of the world. And, uh, and in general, and in fact, your book starts in the, in the foreword with a comment on how America is sort of unique compared to at least Europe in our approach to failure. So I, what, a story I was told by a, a European cabinet minister, it might have even been Angela Merkel. This was back in 2004. This uh, German cabinet minister, or top government official, told a, a group of us traveling uh, you know, something about there wasn't a lot of new business formation, even while it was declining in the U.S. and Germany. And uh, somebody said, why? She said, well, Europe has been full historically of two kinds of people, the risk takers who are willing to fail and people who sort of do what they're told and, and want to hold on to what they have. And the first kind of people all got on a boat and went to America. <laughs> um, do, is, is America different? Does it have to do with our character, our founding, or does it just have to do with our bankruptcy code? Um, I think these things build on each other. So the reason bankruptcy is actually a relatively modern invention, which most people aren't aware, is it basically comes out of the 19th century. As we now know it, there is something that looks a little bit like it earlier in British common law. Um, but it comes out of uh, the 19th century in the US because in our constitution, it says that the federal government has the power to create a bankruptcy code. And well, you can't prove this, one suspects that this is because so many of the founding fathers were heavily in debt. Um, in fact, when Thomas Jefferson died, they were taking up a collection to pay off his massive debts that he just could not get out from under. Um, he was a very, very good writer and not so good at running a plantation. Um, and that actually ends up showing up, I think, in a lot of ways in the national character. So the reason our bankruptcy code is so much more generous than anywhere else in the world, that people actually don't believe it. People are surprised to hear that harsh, mean America that doesn't care about the downtrodden actually is incredibly lenient uh, if you get into financial trouble. I went to bankruptcy court. I went to Memphis, which is the bankruptcy capital of the world. You went there as a journalist. I went there as a journalist to go, I mean, <laughs> for this book, to go look at what is the worst. Because So we are the bankruptcy capital of the world, and Memphis is the bankruptcy capital of the United States. So we're extrapolating here. Um, Memphis has something like 1% of the population declares bankruptcy every year, which is a really high number. If that were normal, then all of you would know, like half the people you know would have declared bankruptcy at some point in their lives, and that's not the case. So I went to Memphis to look at this, and you would think that I was expecting kind of screaming mothers hurling themselves at the feet of judges and so forth, and it was nothing like this, like traffic court. You can't even believe how much nothing happens in bankruptcy court. You walk up, you're like, I don't have any money. The judge is like, okay, sign this, and then you go away. Um, and this astounds Europeans. When I tried to explain in 2005 when we were having our draconian bankruptcy reform what the new reform looked like, my colleagues at The Economist said, well, obviously you have to reform that. That's ridiculous. And I was like, no, that's the draconian new reform, not the lax old system. Um, because in no other country in the world can you just walk into a judge and say, I can't pay. And the judge is like, OK, well, you don't have to. Go in peace. <laughs> that doesn't happen anywhere else. Everywhere else they put you on a payment plan, and it's harsh, and so forth. Um, it's so different that I was in the middle of, early in this book, I was interviewing an, an expert on a completely different topic. And he just started making fun of the US bankruptcy code because he thinks it's crazy that we do this. Um, and this guy's Scandinavian. So you would think he would be, no. He, just, he thought it was absurd that you could just borrow money and then just weasel out of the debt. Um, but it turns out to be a really kind of hidden strength of our economy because when you look at states, so the law is federal, but the exemptions are state level. And states with more generous exemptions, if you can shield more from your creditors, you get a higher rate of entrepreneurship. And this is built out of the fact that in the 19th century, unlike most places, we had a lot of very small landholders. 
in Western states who owed a lot of money to bankers back, e back east. And so in 1898, when we finally set up our permanent bankruptcy code, because while the Constitution said you could have one, it didn't say you had to. Um, we finally passed one in the 1890s. All of the, the people in the West, who each had two senators, just like the people in the East, went and said, make it easy for me to get out of my debts. And they did. And that actually then changes, though, how you see people who declare bankruptcy. In America, we tend to view people who declare bankruptcy not as rich people who are trying to get out of paying their tailor, but people who had an enterprise where they took on too much debt for capital investment, and then something out of their control, like a crop failure, wiped them under. And that, in turn, means that we are, again, laxer. Um, and so I think that these two things build together. And you know, I was asked today, uh, could it be genetic? And I'm sure there's part of that. Right? Um, I was talking to historian John Hale, who pointed out that the Vikings, strangely, are the world's most violent and warlike race. And then suddenly, they turn into Swedes. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened? Right? And, and his theory was, well, all the violent and warlike ones left, and many of them are now in Minnesota. Um, <laughs> so that could be part of it, too. But I think a lot of it is the culture and the institutions, because you see, even within the United States, when people move to a state that has a high level of entrepreneurship, like they are participating in that culture, not wherever they came from. The, I mean, the other side of that, though, right, is worries about moral hazard. Anytime you have this thing where he says, if you fail, you're, you're kind of OK, you're encouraging excessive risk taking. And by a lot of accountings, the financial collapse we just had was from excessive risk taking when there was uh, an implicit sort of Uber bankruptcy behind these banks where they knew that they would only be allowed to fail so much. So it, could it be that, especially considering the, the crash we just had or other, that, that moral hazard of bankruptcy is causing as much harm as uh, the sort of cushioning is causing good? So moral hazard in bankruptcy is real. You can see it. So for one thing, uh, Todd Zwicky, who's a great bankruptcy scholar at, at George Mason, and I disagreed about the 2005 bankruptcy reform. I was against it precisely because of that entrepreneurship connection. He was for it. Um, and he had, he had said, you'll see the rates of bankruptcy drop. And he was right about that, and I was wrong. So um, I think we can infer from that that there was some abuse. There were people who didn't need to declare bankruptcy who were. And yet, at the same time, most people who could benefit from bankruptcy don't use it. By far, I mean, percentages, much, m many more people don't use it when they could than do use it when they shouldn't. Um, in general, we focus a lot on abuse. We focus a lot on moral hazard because it really ticks off a deep, and correctly, right? I mean, Bernie Madoff, we should be really angry at him. He did something really terrible. Um, but the optimal level of abuse is not zero. You tend to think, you, you talk to banks, right? Well, they don't really say this, but it is sort of widely known in the banking industry that they just tolerate some level of embezzlement. Because the optimal amount of embezzlement re reduction is not 100%. Because that getting that last 10% is so much more expensive than getting the first 90% that at some point you've consumed all of the resources. It's like your immune system. You don't want an immune system that attacks any single thing that gets into your system, because then you will die of these autoimmune diseases. Um, and so do I think there was moral hazard in the financial crisis? Yes, I do. Do I think that that's why we had the financial crisis? No, I tend to attribute it actually to a different phenomenon, which I also discuss in this book, which is the desire and the belief that you have engineered risk out of the system. There is nowhere as dangerous as safe. So when I started as an economics journalist in 2003, I was reporting on something called the Great Moderation. Does anyone remember this? This is great. Whole careers, where I was talking to Ken Rogoff in 2008, and he just sort of meditatively said, yeah, whole careers have been built on, on dissertations about the Great Moderation. I don't know what happens to any of those people. What was the Great Moderation? So the idea of the Great Moderation was that um, regulation had gotten, regulators had gotten so smart and so good at their jobs that we were never going to have another financial crisis again. That it just wasn't possible to have in a, in a big country like the United States or the EU to have a financial crisis the way we did in 1930. And you really saw this reflected in a whole lot of things. So the bankers, for example, you would talk to them about um, debt and mortgage bonds and so forth, and they would say things like, Yes, but for this to be a problem, you would need a sustained nationwide decl decline in house prices, and we've not had one of those since the Great Depression. With the implication that, of course, since the Great Depression was impossible, I tend to think of the financial crisis mostly, not entirely, but mostly as a story of everyone getting the same bad signal from the market. 
the central bankers saw what they were doing and the other regulators of the financial system saw, were easing things off in various ways. And what they saw was that nothing happened. And in fact, the economy grew and inflation was level and everything looked great. Bankers were loosening credit restrictions. And what they saw was that defaults were going down. It wasn't dangerous to make a subprime loan for about 10 years. And every year they inched it a little wider and every year they saw their defaults being fine. Now we now know that the reason defaults were fine was that because house prices just kept rising, anyone who got into trouble could simply sell the house rather than getting into trouble. Homeowners saw that everyone they knew had gotten rich owning a house, right? It was the best deal ever. You could buy a house, put in a pool and granite countertops, you could enjoy the pool and the granite countertops and you could also retire on that. Savings as consumption, everyone thought that they had found a sure thing. And when you find that, think that you have gotten to a place where you are, you are safe, you're, you're in for a double whammy. First of all, it probably means that you have reduced the number of bad things that happen, but increased the shock when they do. But it also means you're completely unprepared for it, which is, in fact, where we were. Well, Tyler, uh, Megan gives the account that it was more the, the suspicion that we weren't going to fail that led to the financial crisis. I remember reading an account you wrote a few years ago in the, an article called The Inequality That Matters, sort of that uh, a lot of bankers were kind of banking on the fact that something like, hey, they can't let us all go out of business now. So you bet on together on an, an unlikely, but against an unlikely but catastrophic event. Um, Am I interpreting that correctly? Do you buy into her idea that it was sort of this mass idea that we were safe that led to that? Or was it moral hazard and the idea that they won't let the banks fail that led to that? I think you have both as factors. It's not that banks woke up in 2005 and said, I'm going to take this very risky gamble. And if and when it goes bad, someone else will pay. It's the fact that someone else was going to pay that meant the cognitive pressures that would have otherwise wised up banks or made them think more critically were never there in the first place. So they're not cynically playing moral hazard, but the cognitive framing is itself shaped by the existence of moral hazard. And in this sense, the two explanations are fully complementary. What I wanted to ask Megan is today in the US, as a result of this financial crisis, we have this group of people, the long-term unemployed, they made mistakes, it seems they're still keeping their reservation wages too high. They're much less mobile than American workers were in the 1980s. And somehow they, as a group of people, have not failed well as the key to success. And what is it that they're missing? How does it that they fit into the story? What's the variable that makes them different from, say, how it is you ended up with a job for The Economist and doing multiple other wonderful things? Um, part of it is systemic, obviously. I mean, I was unemployed uh, for two years between 2001 and 2003, or I, I had sort of intermittent jobs, but I did not have anything that looked like a permanent full-time employment opportunity. Um, and 2001, while it was bad, was not as bad as 2008 was. Um, and what we're actually seeing now, it looks to me as if, if you lost your job after 2012, you're basically back in the labor market of 2007. It's the people who lost their jobs between 2008 and 2013 who are basically still stuck if they didn't manage to get out quickly. Um, basically, your resume ages after about six months, and then you're in real trouble. But even back in 2001, what I observed was that you had two groups of people, basically. Um, this is a bit of a simplification, as everything is. But you had people who kind of freaked out and did a lot of different things. And they left the house, they volunteered, they, they, whatever it was. I mean, I knew one guy who ended up working for his uncle's pizzeria. And when last heard, was opening multiple franchises around, you know, sometime in 2005. Um, and it wasn't what he thought he was doing, but he turned out he kind of liked making pizza. Um, so it was the people who were willing to do anything and this is often not what you hear. People will tell me, well, I can't take a job at Walmart. It would look bad on my resume. But actually, you know, you also hear stories of people who are in Starbucks and some guy says, oh, you're good at selling. Come work for me. Um, every time you do something, you are opening up the possibility of something that will turn into something better. It's never coming into your bedroom. Or I guess it did in my case because I was blogging in my pajamas. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was still doing something that, that connected to the outside world. So part of it is moving around. Part of it is um, 
I like an unemployment to a dark room. They sort of shove you in, they shut the door, and now you can't see anything, and you need to find the entrance. Well, it's dark and scary, and your instinct is to sit there and to wait for things to be back to normal. But you're not actually going to find the entrance unless you're moving, even though you're stumbling and you're going to run into people and so forth. And it's terrible. And this book does not in any way take the position that failure is great. We're just all going to really enjoy it, because you don't enjoy it. It doesn't feel good. Um, every t- when you're unemployed, every time you go out and, and look for work, you are basically going out and saying, hey, want to reject me? And most people say, yes, I do. <laughs> um, but so the people who just kept trying anything, whatever it was, and my favorite story, one of my favorite stories anyway in the book is Harlan Sanders, who was just a serial failure. I mean, this guy, um, he kept losing jobs. His wife left him because she was so sick of it. She came back, but then they got divorced later. Um, and then finally in his 40s, he kind of gets it together. And then and he has a little cafe on one of the main highways in Kentucky. It was in the Duncan Hines Guide, which actually, Duncan Hines actually used to be a person. He wrote travel guides before he was a cake mix. <laughs> um, and then the state of Kentucky in the 50s builds a throughway, bypasses his business, and he's, he loses his business. And instead, he's 65 years old at this point, he just picks up, takes a pressure cooker, and starts going door to door to restaurants, goes to conventions, and says, give me five cents of chicken, and I will show you how to make the best fried chicken you've ever had. And he's cooking fried chicken for people to show them. And then one, it, he asked like a thousand people, and most of them turned it down, and one of them took him up on it, and the rest is history. Now, not, is everyone going to be Colonel Sanders? Obviously not. Um, but how do you have the best shot? It's to keep moving. And I think that policy-wise, we made mistakes on that. We made, you know, we now are, are looking at North Carolina's unemployment uh, benefits, and I think that we do have evidence that the way that we lengthened unemployment benefits caused people because it is the worst feeling not to be moral hazard in the sense of, I'm just going to enjoy living off my unemployment benefits. There's some of that. I'm not going to say there isn't. I know people who've done it. But most of it is, when I look for a job, I feel anxious and terrified, and I can't stand it. I'm going to do that later. Um, and when you have money coming in, later is a lot later. But the problem is the resume is over time more scarring. We could have done a lot better on the policy front on that. We could have looked for ways to keep people connected to the labor force one way or the other with wage subsidies, with some sort of... Um, not forever, something pegged to the unemployment rate, but something that would have kept people, because the best place to look for a job is always from a job. Instead, we let people get stuck in this bad equilibrium, and I don't know how to get them out, because um, at this point, you know, as a, on the policy level, I have some suggestions. I talk about them in the book. Um, but you know, we really need to take that incredibly seriously, because the last time this happened, the way we fixed it was World War II, and I don't think that's really a good plan for, for this. We really need to be thinking of this. Personally, the main thing to do is just keep moving and keep do something. It doesn't matter what it is. Take a job at Walmart. Do something that is going to get you back connected to the labor force, and then work from there instead of waiting for, for something to happen. But on a policy level, this should be our number one national priority right now. This is a phenomenally stupid waste of human capital. It's bad for individuals because unemployment is about the worst thing that can happen to you in a modern society, short of death or dismemberment. But it's also for the economy. We're already losing labor force participation because people are retiring. The baby boomers are leaving the workforce. We cannot afford to have these people out of work. Um, I want everybody to come up with a question in a, in a minute. But my, my last question for you now, Meg, so everybody contemplate, mull your questions. Um, you talk about blame in the book and sometimes uh, how it's it's almost instinctual for us to blame people. I think that in my mind that ties in with kind of a the the American mindset that made us so upset about the bailouts and about other things is you did something wrong. You ought to suffer. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder in uh, a lot of my ideological compatriots who are, you know, conservatives, if that's part of their opposition to a, a generous safety net, is that they think if, as Herman Cain said, if you're not rich, that's nobody's fault but your own, blame yourself. That is, is that a, a natural thing? Is that an American thing? Is that problematic? Don't we need to sort of have some sort of blame and opprobrium? Uh, failure should feel bad. So the mistake is to say failure feels bad, let's make it not feel bad, or let's try to make it not happen. Um, Because if failure didn't feel bad, we would stop doing whatever it was, right? But it should feel bad in a very specific way. So an example of really bad failure, feeling bad, is prison, where you kind of screw up, you do something wrong, 
20 or 100 times, and then suddenly we lock you away for 25 years, right? That's not a, a good way. You, you've destroyed a human life, um, which is serious, even if they've done something wrong. And pe most people in prison have done something wrong. I'm not of the opinion that it's all nonviolent drug offenders. I spent a week in Hawaii's probation uh, system, which was an, would be enough to have As a journalist. Me. As a journalist, it, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> they did, actually. It was interesting. They locked me in a holding cell for, a, like, a minute. <laughs> and I thought I would do anything. I would be on my knees in front of that judge saying, how do I never go back there? So it was amazing to me anyone ever goes to the, the prison system twice. Um, but it's, it's a really bad way of, of handling it. And I think Americans, our, our answer to the crime wave was just to make sentences longer and longer. And that didn't work. What we should have been doing was making them more consistent. They should have happened every single time and they should have been short and more easy to recover from. Um, so I think of that with bankruptcy too. Bankruptcy does hurt and it should. There's a social stigma on it and there should be. Because you know, you, most people in bankruptcy did make mistakes. They don't just end up there because uh, a financial whirlwind came by. Most of them borrowed more money than they could really reasonably afford to repay, or they borrowed money that if anything at all went wrong, they were likely to not be able to repay. On the other hand, many people in this room, I would wager to say, if they were out of work for a year, would not be able to pay their debts, because that's generally true of most Americans. I'm not picking on you guys particularly. <laughs> um, most people live that way. These are the people who got caught living that way. Um, and, and so generally, it's not that there isn't moral hazard and we don't need to punish people. It's that we focus too much on it. Because the problem with, with it is, first of all, we tend to do this thing, blame storming, right? It's where you sit down and we all figure out who, who did this and, and how we can get him. Um, and that tends to make you overlook the systemic causes. And okay, so now we fired the guy who was bad, and he feels really bad, and we still have the same, exactly the same systemic problem. The same incentives are there. Um, and, and so generally, I, I, I think it's not that you don't want there to be consequences. Failure, unemployment shouldn't feel good even if you didn't do anything to deserve it, because otherwise you won't exit quickly enough. Um, what you want to do is figure out, are we making the pain the right kind of pain or not? Probably didn't do a great job with that in the financial crisis. On the other hand, when I look at the Great Depression, all those guys are still rich. Well, the, C the bank I, CEOs, you know, they, it's not like they're I don't pauper. think that's right. I don't think that's right. Like, like if you went to a, a person, if I lost my job, and a person in Tanzania asked me why I was sad about it, and I was like, "Well, I'm going to have to sell my house and move to an apartment, and it's not going to be in a nice neighborhood, and I won't have a car," and he'd be like, "So you're going to have hot and cold running water, and you're not going to be hungry at all, and like the roof is going to keep rain off." It doesn't work that way. You don't think, "Oh well, I'm better off than a farmer in Tanzania. I guess I don't mind losing my job then, right?" And and they feel the same way. Rich people aren't special in that way. Everyone hates losing status. Everyone hates losing 95% of what they have, which is what happened to Dick Bold. Uh, and the president of Bear Stearns. Um, so, you know, I don't know how much, Dick Fold acted like an idiot. It's, it's really hard to read the books about what he did and not think he acted like an idiot. I and mean, he acted like an idiot in a way that many, 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 many people in the world act like idiots. Um, do I want to single out Dick Fold and be like, if there but, you know, if it, were, if it were not for him acting like an idiot, everything would have been fine. I tend to think that there would have been some other idiot who would have done something fairly similar. Before we go to questions, Tyler, do you have any? Well, I've been thinking about what's the private and social wedge here? So let's say you take biology. There's mutation. Most mutations are bad for the individual animal or human being, but they may be good for the species as a whole because it allows it to evolve, change, develop, and so on. So failing well in your account, on net overall, are you saying that it's something that's good for society or good for America, but actually bad for people? So we need to subsidize them to take more chances so they can fail well for our mutual benefit, which if everyone fails better and better, will be good for most people. Or are you saying that failing well is something which if we did a bit more of at the margin would be good for us too? We can't do it because we're weak and we're craven and we hate failing. And we need to be nudged in that direction. But more failing well will be good for individuals and be good for the broader polity. Now note, if you're saying the latter, this has big implications for children and education. One thing interesting in your book, there's very little in here about children, which is quite striking, I think. And how one would deal with a child is a very good cutting edge question for where these margins fall. Because there, you just care about the child. You don't care about the social benefits of what your child might learn. 
Uh, so in general, what your views are on the wedge between private and social benefits, what gets subsidized, what are the, what are the behavioral imperfections, and do we as purely selfish individuals actually want to take the weird pill that will mean we take more chances and fail better but have all that pain in the meantime? Yes or no, should we take some more weird pills? We should take <laughs> some more weird pills as individuals. I say this as like somewhat weird individual, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I may not be entirely objective here. Um, the downside in America is just not that far down, right? As I say, the worst thing that happens to most people who lose their jobs is that they end up living in a smaller house in a less nice part of town. It is not that they end up starving to death or that they end up dying of some disease that, they, that, that we know how to cure but didn't bother to. Um, and given that, on the margin, we should be willing to take more risks than we, than we are. We, we tend to think about this as if we're still out on the veldt somewhere, and if we screw up, we could get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. Um, I actually don't know if saber-toothed tigers lived on the veldt, but you know, <laughs> failing gracefully onwards. Um, that for individuals, it is also better to take more weird pills. Um, for individuals, that, that kind of mediocrity median um, is not actually such a happy place to be often because you spend too much time trying to defend your place in it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think of this with educa education. I mean, I, had, I did have a chapter on kids in the book, but since I don't have kids, I didn't want to be in the position of that person who's like, hey, I've got a lot of great child parent, uh, parenting tips for all you fo folks who are actually doing it. Um, but so I look at the way the educational system works, and it's a good example, right? Um, I think it's, it's reasonable to say that 60 years ago, college education in America actually was a way in which people were acquiring skills and getting vaulted into the workforce um, and actually sort of bettering both their productivity and their chances. I think now what you're looking at, but also that it wasn't nearly so much higher pressure. You went to college. You could afford to work your way through college. Um, the cost of it was pretty minimal. The, the, the upside was, was pretty good. Now college is mostly about, as far as I can tell, about loss aversion. It's about people in the upper middle class who are desperate to make sure that their kids can't possibly fall out of the upper middle class. And the problem with that is now everyone wants to send their kids to elite schools that have exactly the same number of seats as they do when I was born in 1973, more or less. And there's a lot more kids trying to go through that funnel. So that when I was admitted to Penn in 1990, it was um, there were about a third of the class got let in and now it's under 10%, and that's the second highest admit rate in the Ivy League. And it's making people act insane, and everyone hates it. All the parents I know who spend all of their time being terrified that their children are going to end up homeless um, and react to that by spending all of their time shepherding their children through 97 activities designed to uh, ensure that they're both a champion con concert violinist and an award-winning soccer player, as well as, of course, being a straight-A student so that it will look good on their college application. They hate it, and they feel like they can't stop that we're now actually in this zero-sum competition where we're doing more and more things no one wants to do merely to ensure that we stay in this narrow band. Wow, my aspiration is that my kids lose lots of chess matches. Um, <laughs> OK, questions. Starting in the back, wait for the, the microphone. Uh, yeah, we got a microphone coming on the back row there. Great. Uh, thanks, Mr. Carney. Much obliged for the forum. Uh, Ms. McArdle, I have, well, you know, I was one among the um, yes, uh, lucky you folks to, uh, to catch your forum the other day. Could you um, survey the, uh, the, the gulf, one of the points you made the other day, the gulf in perspective between failing at business, starting a business, running a business in the United States uh, versus Europe? Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a big difference. And so what's actually interesting is that we're not the best at making it easy to start a business. There are lots of countries, and we should be, by the way. We should make it a lot easier to start a business here, just in terms of the paperwork and finding out if you're legal. Um, and I, one way in which we're really getting worse at this, and, and a lot of the reason that I wrote the book is that I think America is getting worse at this in a lot of ways, is that businessmen now exist in this state of radical uncertainty where I talked to a guy who started a business and he eventually got out of it because he said he couldn't tell whether he was in compliance. And this guy is, uh, A, pretty liberal, so he wasn't just uh, railing against big government to no purpose. And he wasn't against regulations, but he said he didn't know whether, the, he said the payroll company, for example, would just add, give him a $100 charge on something, and he would have no way to dispute it. He would just fit, hope they were doing their jobs right because he couldn't get, 
he couldn't tell whether he was in compliance with the payroll laws in his state, which is a pretty liberal, heavily regulated state. Um, on the other hand, I interviewed a Danish entrepreneur, and he was like, no, OSHA is great. They come in, and they tell you if it doesn't look safe, and then you try to fix it. Because of course, I'm in there too. I don't want it to be unsafe. It was a totally different attitude, and I think a much healthier attitude. But what we are good at is, uh, actually, Tim told me a great story once about talking to Swiss bankers about why they didn't start their own banks. And this is something that I've heard in other ways from other people. And they were like, you know, here it'd be like if you were, if you knew an 18-year-old kid who was getting married, people would be like, well, I hope that works out for you, but that's not a good idea. Why would you leave a good job at a solid company to go try that? Um, and in part, that's because they're not as kind to people who have done it and failed. And so... Um, there are systematic differences, some of them way towards Europe. Regu on the regulatory side, we could be better. We could be a lot better. We're very adversarial with businesses, but on the cultural side, I think we, we're, we're, we are definitely doing better. But you tell the story of what was it, the photographer whose yes. business failed, and it just it saddled him for years. Yeah, he's been basically, he, shut, he had to lay off a lot of employees in 2001. Um, not a huge number, six or seven, uh, but in Denmark, if you lay off employees, you have to pay them between three and six months of their wages. He, that saddled him with a debt, and because it's, this is at the same time that your business is going under, so it's usually not a good time to be coming up with that kind of money. Um, he, is, he was still trying to pay off that debt in 2012. The same amount of debt. It basically hadn't gone anywhere. Um, and he was on the verge of losing his house because of it. And that kind of just tying people to old bad decisions. And it wasn't even a bad decision, it was just that photography, he was a photographer and, and photography changed. Um, it got a lot more competitive after digital cameras came in and the cost of production went down and there was a lot more, less premium to skill basically. Um, and he's still working as a photographer but he's not expanding and he can't do anything because he's got that, that debt sitting there that is the first thing he has to do and he can't declare bankruptcy because his creditors won't let him. Yeah, I was talking to an entrepreneur uh, who said he actually only likes to hire people who failed a couple of times because that guy, when something goes wrong, is going to be like, yeah, we tried that. That did not work. <laughs> Sounds like it would work. We, we really wished we'd done this other thing. Let's do that instead. Um, and also that when things fail, generally because they've been through it, they don't freak out and start running around like chickens with their heads cut off. They say, oh, yeah, I've seen this. We, you know, let's, here are three ways we could deal with it. All right, more questions. Uh, yeah, up here in front. Uh, I want to go back to the higher education issue uh, in particular because it seems that all the political stakeholders involved, state governments, federal government, think tanks, philanthropists, have bought into the degree throughput at all costs idea. If we have more bachelors of arts, ipso facto, economic growth will go up. How do you convince all those people that it's about skills? Um, that's really difficult. There's a great book called Seeing Like a State, which talks about the ways in which, you know, states have to make things legible in a kind of systematic way that we can deal with. They need things that they can see pretty clearly. And a degree is really easy to observe. And in fact, that is part of the reason that we're getting into this mindless credentialism, right? A degree is something that HR can specify. And it's something that Google is now trying to move away from because it's stupid. Um, no offense to the college professor on the panel. Well, <laughs> but he teaches real skills. Um, but, and similarly, right, if you are a politician, you can say, I am proposing that we do a million more college graduates a year. It is a hard number. It sounds right. You can describe how to get to that. I mean, it's actually a lot harder than it sounds because it turns out that the marginal people who, tend, who go in tend to be much more likely to flunk out than the people who are already there. Um, but it's something that you can at least pretty easily outline a plan to do with financing and so forth. Um, it's really hard to say, I want to make American students 7% better at handling failure and 12% better at doing basic math. I mean, you can kind of describe it, but it's a, we've been pushing on that for the basic math lever for a long time, and it's slow going. And so people tend to describe the credential instead of the thing that the credential is supposed to represent. Your observations in academia, Tyler? Well, I don't think we need so much to talk people out of that model, because the revenue model is collapsing from the labor market side. So four-year college graduates 
earned higher average salaries in the year 2000 than they're earning today. And we had somewhat of what you might call a bubble in student debt, which is now more or less over. So you have wages in absolute terms going down, st student debt at previous levels being a thing of the past. So politicians can say what they want, but I think a lot of schools are going to see sluggish enrollments, and we're going to see two sets of responses. People who churn on that treadmill harder and harder to get into the top places, which will be a kind of nightmare, and then people who drop out altogether and stop trying, which will be a nightmare of a different kind. So we may get the worst of those two worlds, but I don't think we're going to have the problem of just massive more and more throughput. In a way, we may envy the days when that was our stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> more questions? Uh, yes. Gentleman with the orange pocket square. <laughs> Celebration of Denmark's speed skating victories in the Olympics, well. no doubt. Hi, Michael Barone with AEI and the Washington Examiner, uh, where I'm a colleague of Tim's on both accounts. Um, Megan mentioned that one of the reasons bankruptcy works is there's a stigma to it. And it seems to me that much of American life, we give people second chances, we stigmatize them, we have to keep that balance. You could argue that in the 1970s, we reduced the stigma on divorce. And lots of people got divorced, which turned out to be sort of bad. And then, as our colleague Charles Murray pointed out, uh, well-credentialed, affluent people stopped getting divorced. And uh, people in Bel his Belmont and people in Fishtown are still getting divorced or indeed never getting married. And um, how do we maintain that balance uh, if there's a moral component to it? I don't think you address that a lot in your book, and I'd be curious about Tyler's idea, and is there some way to quantify that? No, shall I go for um, I think this is hugely important, and we tend to really underweight. Um, I do talk in the book about Russia, where there was a lot of thinking in the early 90s as people tried to reconstruct the former Soviet Union that Markets were just the absence of government. They were this natural inheritance that we had. And you just removed the government, and now markets. And it turned out that that was wildly wrong. There's an enormous amount of, I think of it as the, the, the software of a society, right? The hardware is, is the capital. Um, and then you can think of the, the operating system as the institutions in that country, the cultural capital that you have that helps the hardware run, that makes it worth something. And it's little things like standing in line. I mean, this sounds really dumb, but the way you stand in line actually matters a lot for how you manage big crowds of people moving somewhere. But it's also this sense that um, I send money all the time to random strangers I've never met on the internet, and they send me stuff back. And I think I've had a couple. You're talking of about perfectly licit purchases. Yes, no, 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 eBay and Amazon. Yes. And um, but it's phenomenal how much of that just works on trust. It would be a lot more fraud could be happening, and it's just not. And it's because we have this culture, and countries that don't have this cultural uh, operating system, you see a lot more fraud happening. Yeah, it, there's if you don't trusting strangers is actually really hard to do, and it takes a lot of cultural work to make that happen. And similarly. I, I, I agree with you that we had a lot of cultural capital around marriage and family, and we decided sometime, I would actually trace it to the 50s, because that's when it shows up in the movies and so forth. We decided sometime in the 1950s that that was all stupid. And there's a great, uh, G.K. Chesterton um, describes this, the, I call it the problem of Chesterton's fence, where it says, you, a guy comes to a fence in the middle of the road and says, this fence is dumb. There's no reason for it to be here, let's tear it down. And he says, that's the last person who should be allowed to tear it down. Because the fence didn't just grow there. Someone put it there for a reason. And if you know what the reason is, then you can say, OK, that reason no longer applies. We should get rid of it, or we can do something better. But if you just say, this is stupid, and we should just destroy the fence, um, then you are a dangerous lunatic and should not be listened to. And we did that with a lot of stuff around marriage and family in the 50s is that we just decided that for some reason our ancestors were all morons and that we knew better and that we were going to get rid of all of these dark outmoded ideas about marriage um, and children and so forth. And I think that we are paying the price for that now. And when you see it's true that in the elites, marriage is great. It's never been better. 
um, Catherine Eden, who's a sociologist, calls the super, super relationships, um, where you meet this person, you have huge numbers of interests in common, you like vacation together and so forth, um, but at the bottom, marriage is disintegrating. And we need to figure out how to put that back together because uh, Murray is absolutely right. The, the values that the elites espouse are not the values that they, pra that they actually practice. The values they practice look a lot more like early 1950s America, um, and they work. They're better places to raise kids, and they're better for the people in them. It is better to have someone else with, who has your back. It is better. Those things are important. Um, I don't know how to get back there, though. That's, the, you know, the, how do you do cultural change? <laughs> One of 300 million people at a time. I mean, on that, you know, I may be more pessimistic about stigma. So I think of a lot of human beings as naturally being fairly cranky and prejudiced in a lot of ways. And our choice variable is how much stigma can we apply? So I'm pretty happy for stigma as a whole to be weakened because it means a lot more tolerance for groups which otherwise suffer under stigma. It means you lose stigma against a lot of bad activities also. But on that, I think it's been a, a big gain to have stigma weakened. And even with marriage weakening, my reading of that is that a pretty big chunk of men are just rotten. You know, maybe born so. And what's really weakened marriage is women at lower income and education levels deciding they don't want to be married to rotten men. And I know this can be bad for the kids. I know there are negative social externalities. But on the whole, I think of that as a welfare improvement. To be married to some guy a woman doesn't want to be married to, and he beats her, or other things happen, I think she's better off on her own You know, when she's choosing that. So even at current margins, I would actually rather still see stigma as a whole be somewhat weaker, and we be more tolerant and less prejudiced, and incur the social costs that are going to come with that. We have time for one more question up here. Thank you. No, I just bought the book, so congrats. I'm looking forward to reading it. And uh, congratulations to you, sir. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I'm the winner here. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if we're talking about stigma and what we could call clemency as kind of an old Roman pedigree or mercy, um, you know, in terms of managing failure. Is there some sort of inverse graph that's related to a culture that is has stigma but also values giving people a second try, mercy. I mean, have you looked at that in any uh, prolonged way? Or? I've thought a lot about it. And I mean, over I ended up writing a book that sort of emphasized forgiveness and said it, it tends to be cheaper than we think it is. We can often shoot ourselves in the foot pursuing that last measure of justice. Uh, I forget there's some play in which someone says, you know, if, if we actually meted out justice, and who among us could, uh, true, could stand up against true justice? Um, but that doesn't mean that you should just blindly forgive. Right, like Bernie Madoff did something wrong, he should not be allowed to manage money anymore. He should be in jail. Um, so the first thing that you do wanna see is learning from the mistake and the wrong. You wanna see repentance. And obviously that can be faked. But it's harder to fake than you would think. Um, and most people, many people don't even bother to try to fake it, right? So. Um, what I like to think of is, is tighter, a lot of thick social institutions, you could call them, where a lot of this is happening in social circles. And that's true of bankruptcy, right? If you are genuinely just at the end of your rope and you had some terrible medical illness and you have to clear bankruptcy, you'll feel a little bad about it. But basically, your family and friends are going to say, yeah, you know, you, you got cancer, you had a 2000, you lost your, you had a $200,000 mortgage and you lost your job and you know, what else could you do? Um, whereas if you run up profligate credit card debt and so forth, your family and friends kind of know that you were driving a BMW and not on a BMW income. And they're likely to be a little meaner to you than if the problem was that you had a plumbing business you couldn't run while you were ill. And the state can't really tell the difference between yeah, those things. The state can't tell the difference between those things, but, but thick social networks can. And so that's where this all happens. It doesn't happen very much at all at the government level. It happens in that cultural operating system level. Thank you, everybody. We've got uh, books for sale, wine and cheese for free. But first, uh, uh, let's thank Tyler and Megan.